Hi, everyone. My guest today is Gabby Beans. Gabby is a Tony Award nominated actress who is currently starring in the play Jonah at the Roundabout Theater in New York City. Some of her many, but some of her recent TV credits include Presumed Innocent, Succession, Blue Bloods, The Good Fight, House of Cards, and Ray Donovan. Other theater credits include The Skin of Our Teeth at Lincoln Center, for which she was, in fact, nominated for the Tony Award I mentioned earlier. I'm Revolting at the Atlantic Theater Company, Anatomy of a Suicide at the Atlantic Theater Company, and Mary Seacole at Lincoln Center Theater. I am honored to have Gabby Beans on the podcast today. Hello. Hi. Wow. What an introduction. That's um, That makes me feel very fancy. You are so fancy. You are <laughs> so talented. Um, I just saw Jonah at the Roundabout Theater Company, and I want to start with that, and then we'll go backwards to what um, what was in the water when you were growing up that made you realize not just like you wanted to be this, but like you're incredibly talented at, at it. So we'll we'll get to that as well. Um, Jonah is a really beautiful play that takes us through the life of a young woman, Anna, played by you, who we meet in boarding school at the time that we meet her. And I wonder, before we go deep into the process of making this play, if you could sort of do like a very thumbnail sketch about what the play is for people who haven't seen it yet. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's kind of the million dollar question with this piece. Um, I think all really great works of theater are more than the sum of their parts. And that's certainly true for this. So it's kind of hard to give a succinct summary. But I think at its core, this play is about um, Anna, the central character, and her relationship with intimacy. And that her relationship with intimacy with self and with others. And the way that that is explored is through her relationships with three men that enter her life at various periods. Um, and so I guess like without giving too much away, that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of magic in this play. Um, and there are a lot of there's fantasy, there's reality, and the beauty of this production and you being at the center of it is how seamlessly that all happens. Um, I love a play where I'm never ahead of it and I'm not the, you know, sharpest tool in a shed, but sometimes things are so obvious that even I are like, whoa, now I know exactly what's going to happen. Where's the fun? And in this play, What's really thrilling is to see something where you want to go out afterwards and talk about it for a really long time. Everyone has such a different experience in it. But I just want to say, A, you were on stage the entire time. And I just wonder, um, in this deeply intimate piece, sort of how you get ready each night to kind of go on this journey and how did this play come to you so it's a it's a two-parter maybe let's do it in reverse how did Jonah come to you and then let's talk about the process of playing this it's a role with a lot of heavy lifting absolutely so um this play came to me through Danya um I was brought in to replace someone else who had to leave the role due to a shooting commitment and so I came in two weeks before we started rehearsal um, and basically Danya sent me the play and um, I read it and I immediately was very moved um, and also very scared. <laughs> I, I, I saw the, you know, the technical demands and sort of energetic demands of the part and I was very excited by the prospect of exploring it, but I also recognized very acutely that this would be a very challenging undertaking. Um, but after speaking with Danya um, and hearing about her plans, uh, you know, specifically around how she wanted to cultivate trust in the room, um, how she wanted to approach the intimacy that's in the play, physical intimacy that's in the play, and just hearing how she was thinking about the work um, really bolstered my confidence that within that container, I might be able to be of service. 
So, um, and, you know, sometimes you read something and it just doesn't leave you. And you kind of know that that's what you need to move towards. I, I read this play and part of me wanted to say no because I knew it would be such a big challenge, but it just was like haunting me. You know, I was thinking about what it would be like to crack this. So that's how it came to me. And then how do I prepare to uh, do the show? Uh, that's really evolved over the course of the process. Um, I have a pretty extensive warm up. Uh, so, you know, I just warm up my voice and body. I say some of the longer passages, uh, so that the first time I say them isn't on stage that, you know, I, I like to have gotten a few runs in at these longer passages before I step on the stage. And probably one of the best things actually that we do in terms of pre-show rituals is me and the guys all sort of huddle up and like share some sort of uh, words of inspiration. We check in with each other and, um, and then we do kind of like a sports team, like one, two, three, like each year. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then you just do it. But I think like, uh, what Danya is really good at is creating enough of a structure for the play to happen, like a really sturdy structure for the play to happen. So you know your beats and you know the journey that you're taking, but there's so much latitude for play and exploration. Um, and so a lot of what I'm doing before the show is just trying to like be as relaxed as possible so that when I am on stage, I'm available to what wants to happen on any given night. You know, this play deals with trauma and how people survive trauma. And it was just a really beautiful exploration of how your character both protects herself and sort of jumps right into the fire at the same time, right? Like she lives on the edge of, of everything all the time. Um, and there aren't a lot of safe adults around sort of helping her navigate this. And so she grows up really quickly. And we get to watch what um, what pain lingers because of that and how she triumphs in the face of that. And it's a really um, sort of extraordinary uh, commercial for art can save someone, right? Like it's <laughs> like so also within all this, the idea that she, thank God, finds writing and it turns out she's really good at it. Right. Even if, you know, some of us just use journaling as a way to cope. And this character is able to not just journal, but actually put something in the world that helps other people, too. That that's, you know, part of the beauty of this play. And it's not a spoiler alert because it's the moment to moment that gets this character through. That is the um, breathtaking performance of Gabby Bean. So if you're in New York, go see Juna, Jonah. If not, um I'm sure there will be someone who illegally films it and puts it on YouTube for the world to see. <laughs> oh God, not me, but somebody. Film um, theater though is rough. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you know, not everyone can get here, and Absolutely. so that's that's the thing. Anyway, I love that more performances are being filmed. I think, and in a proper way, not in <laughs> not on an iPhone illegally, so that they can be shared. I mean, I think so much of what happened during COVID is we really realized how much we need it, how much we need theater, and we always prefer to be in the room. But sometimes, if the only way to do it is to see a filmed version of it, even though it's a little flat in theater, um, better than nothing. I want to talk to you about sort of how Gabby came to be in New York. So can you talk a bit about where you grew up and, and how, how the acting bug uh, bit you? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a really, it's kind of a funny story because, um, well, I'd always been kind of a ham, you know what I mean? Like, I'm an army brat. So, you know, my dad's a military, was a military officer until he retired from the army. Um, my mom worked as a physician until she um, kind of fell ill and was unable to practice. And, um, but both of them have a lot of appreciation for the arts and like a love of cinema. My mom loves theater. And so 
she was the one who was most reluctant when I decided to pursue acting as a career path. But she's also sort of the reason why I fell in love with theater because growing up, we would, uh, you know, she would always take you in Northern Virginia. She would take us to the many like great, you know, regional theaters in, uh, you know, the DC area. And um, at that time she was still practicing. And so she would come to medical conferences in New York city and she would bring us with her and take us to see Broadway shows. And I just remember sitting, you know, falling in love with New York on that, on those trips and also falling in love with theater on those trips. I think like my favorite feeling probably in the world is the feeling when the theater goes dark right before the play happens. And, you know, you know, you're just about to go through an experience. Like I, I just love that. And I've loved it my whole life. So that's kind of where I got bit by the bug and I had a kind of circuitous route to actually doing this job I I was a neuroscience major in undergrad I was also a theater major but I did more of like a performance studies thesis and I was pre-med I worked in a lab the whole nine and then in my senior year I kind of just had a come to Jesus moment where I was like I gotta give this acting thing a try or else I'm gonna regret it for the rest of my life and so I applied to grad school um and I, so I ended up going to Lambda in London and um, was there for like a year and a half and then came back to New York and uh, more or less have been auditioning and just trying to make it happen. But, but I'm grateful for, uh, I think, you know, I, if, if there's anything that I've learned in my short time in this industry is that all of it is material. So, you know, sometimes I would ask myself like, oh, what if you had started earlier? What if you had gone to conservatory for undergrad and so on, so on and so forth. And what I recognize now is that things come to you at exactly the right time and you just got to go with the flow. When you say army brat, I've had a lot of different actors who also grew up in a military family. I, Julianne Moore, I think lived in like, you know, eight places um, and talked a lot about how sort of wherever she went, the the theater, the auditorium, the theater room, like that was a constant, whether she was in, you know, Virginia or Germany, it was like a touchstone. Um, and I think if you're new somewhere, it it can be a more welcoming room to to walk into in my romanticized version of it anyway. Um, did you move around a lot or were you guys more rooted on one base for longer periods of time? Uh, we moved around a lot. I, I essentially moved every two years until um, I got to high school and then I went to high school in Germany uh, and then after was there for four years and then came to New York for undergrad. But yeah, that's very true. I mean, um, I think like a lot of actors have a nomadic exist early existence because you just learn how to be adaptable and you learn how to sort of uh, slot yourself into various social milieu, like with grace. Um, and so acting is a place where you can exercise that muscle in an artistic sense. So it's not, I'm not surprised to hear that you've had some other army brats. Yes, for sure. Can you just tell me a little bit, because I am sure there are people listening right now who also are children in military families who love theater. I think so much about like walking in as a new person on the first day of anything um, and what it takes to sort of get through that to have to do that multiple times in your young life a did you have siblings um b that were you like a super tight family did you have like a mantra or a thing you did sort of like rituals pre-theater rituals pre-new school that you can kind of talk about you know I think so I have a younger brother but we were never in the same school because of our age difference he's five years younger than me uh, I think like if you're walking into any new situation, the best approach is curiosity. Um, you know, like I 
no, I, I think the best way to make a friend is to be genuinely curious about someone's life experience and to allow them to elaborate on the things that are of interest to you. And if you have a deep curiosity about other people, um, I think that's a very welcoming energy. And, um, and so that's kind of what I would always do. I'd be like, there's going to be someone who's going to talk to me at some point. And even if I'm too afraid to like go up and be like, hi, I'm Gabby. I know I'm going to brush against someone in the lunch line or, you know, I'm going to sit at the same table as someone. And all I have to do in order to forge some sort of con connection, no matter how temporary, is ask them about themselves. So I think that's kind of how I lead in, in new scenarios. Um, That's a great thing for life, right? Hi, I'm Alana, and I'm curious about you, right? Yeah. That's all to do. Um, you were nominated for a Tony, and that is, um, I imagine, a thrilling moment for someone uh, who has dreamed of this. You know, you called yourself a ham as a kid. Often <laughs> that might include, you know, practicing acceptance speeches or like feigning surprise or all sorts of things. <laughs> um Tell me, so Skin of Our Teeth was um, was a show that like, like I would just describe it as exciting, right? The design was exciting. It was taking something that people thought they knew and reimagining it. And in it is this, you know, young woman, Gabby Beans, who has a really memorable, fantastic name. Um, and you're nominated. So where were you? And and how did that, now that you've had some time to process it, uh, can you talk a little bit about that that experience? Yes, of course. I mean, gosh, I never in a million years thought that I would be nominated for a Tony. I mean, of course, like as a young actor, you imagine certain scenarios or or goals that you'd like to achieve people you'd like to work with but I've never been like a super awards oriented person just because uh you know I'm trying to like I'm always trying to like check the ego you know what I mean um because I think it gets in the way of the work a lot of times um so yeah, so first of all, I didn't even expect to be on Broadway because I, I, I'm i not really, like I can sing a little bit, but I'm not like a musical theater singer. And a lot of the straight plays are cast from people who have, you know, a lot of TV and film credits uh, because, you know, that's the nature of the economics of theater in the city. So Liliana, Blaine Cruz is the director, was the director of Skin of Our Teeth. And, and we'd worked with each other, I guess that was our fourth thing together. So that's kind of how I got the audition, I suppose. And I read the play and I remember just being like, this play is insane, but this part is like one of the best I've ever read. And I convinced myself I was like there's no way they were gonna cast anyone who isn't famous I mean it's such a huge incredible part <laughs> and so I just went into the audition and I was like I'm just gonna do exactly what I'm interested in I have no fear because I have zero chance of getting this and I think it's that kind of abandon that probably allowed me to show up for that opportunity in the way that I needed to show up in order to secure the job so anyway so it's our I, I just say that to gesture at the fact that it was such a, it, it it was all such a like unbelievable thing that then once we got into previews and, you know, you, you go to the stage door and people start telling you, you're going to get nominated for a Tony. And for me, I'm like, that just seems crazy. Like, it's already crazy that I'm doing this role. It's already crazy that I'm on Broadway. I, my, my, I just can't even believe that I would also be honored in such a profound way for doing what I love to do. And I also just kind of interpreted that as, okay, this is a way for people to say that they really like the performance and that's how I'm going to interpret it. And so the day when the announcement came out, I absolutely like did not watch the video. <laughs> like I just decided I, my phone was on do not disturb. Like I just got up and like did the dishes and washed my face. 
And then when I finally took my phone off of do not disturb, I had like 50 text messages and lots and lots of calls. And then I sort of caught on. I was like, okay, well, I don't think this many people would be texting me to say, sorry, you can get nominated for Tony. Um, and so it was, yeah, it was a whirlwind experience and just a huge, 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 huge honor that I'm still uh, just incredibly grateful for. Beyond the um, the sort of affirmation as you describe it, do you feel like it has had an impact that you can feel yet on your career? Absolutely, a hundred percent. I mean, prior to the nominee, I mean, I, 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 it's, it's, it's improved my career prospects in so many ways. I, uh, my representation changed a little bit in a way that has really helped me. I'm working with some really incredible managers um, who have already opened tons of doors. And I think that really what that nomination did for me, at least how I feel it qualitatively is like, you just get taken a little bit more seriously and you get given the benefit of the doubt in a way that's really helpful in such a competitive industry. So, you know, Whereas before the nomination, I would only be offered things that from people I knew very well or from things I had developed over a very long period of time. Now I'm getting offers from people I don't even know who just, you know, believe that I, I'm able to, to 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 serve the piece. And so having that latitude is incredibly wonderful and also I, I think I have a little bit more agency over what I choose to do now um which is all I've ever wanted <laughs> right 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 and so rare in this business sadly yes. Yes. um I have to talk to you a little bit about a show that really was like a cultural moment um succession you are part of that show and the history of that show in a really sort of iconic scene with Cousin Greg. And I wonder if you don't mind talking about that experience because it really is, um, that was really appointment television for so many people. And so like, how was it? How did that come to you? Um, yeah, anything that you can kind of remember, share. Oh, yeah, that was such a dreamy experience. I mean, Succession's like all, you know, many of us. It's one of my favorite shows of all time. And so I auditioned for, I actually auditioned for the part of the crisis manager that Cousin Greg kind of flirts with. And I was on the hook, like, you know, they were considering me that for that for a while. It went another way. And so, you know, I think kind of as a consolation prize, they gave me this other part. Um and yeah, that was my first job back after lockdown. So I definitely was like very, very talkative because I had just had not been around that many people in so long. And I have to say, Nick Braun was really cool to work with, really, really talented, like improviser, actor. And what was so striking about being on that set for just, you know, the day I was there was how... It, it's actually kind of a lot like theater the way they shoot it because they don't block the scene like in in a way that I've experienced a lot of TV to be. They kind of allow their actors to move according to their impulse, which I think is why it has such a live sort of almost documentary quality to it sometimes. it's it just feels very, you know, a high level of veracity. Um, so it was just cool to watch him work and to see how he approached the scene, to improvise with him a little bit. And also, you know, um, working with, you know, Jesse Armstrong was there and seeing how they would like sort of gently tweak lines. They would feed me jokes, uh, you know, try it this way, try it that way. And just to see people operating on such a high level of creativity and skill was just super, super, you know, inspiring. I love, I just remember, you know, he's really trying to figure out like all of this legal, he's in a legal crisis. <laughs> and, and I just remember you're like, you know what, I'm a, I'm a first year law student. So I don't, and he's really looking to you like you're, you know, a Supreme Court judge. 
Yeah, it's, it was a really like ill considered move on Cousin Greg. But I have to say one really funny story from that yeah. day that if anyone who's a fan of the show, I like this stays in my heart forever. So if anyone's a fan of the show, I think they'll like it. Um, it was Nick Braun's first day back after lockdown, too. So he was, you know, he had expressed, he was like, yeah, I got to get back into it. And I don't know if he does this every day, but that day before the cameras would start rolling, he would go into a corner and like wring his hands and say, oh God, oh man, oh God, oh man, oh God, oh man, to get into character. And it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And so right. Exactly. Like that, that was his, his method, right? <laughs> yeah. So if it was right after lockdown, is that when things were being filmed, but everyone is masked and separated and tested? So it it's like a absolutely it's like a very different way to shoot, right? You're kind of in a bubble, you go do your work, you're back in a bubble. Well, you did it. And you guys were so for two people who were in masks and like covered in plastic <laughs> until action each time I felt like you were so deeply connected and it felt like these were friends who knew each other um yeah. and such an unlikely wonderful pairing of you know this guy who's so unhinged and this woman who is so stable solid grounded like feet <gasps> firmly planted on the ground it was like such perfect casting in oh, terms man. of Thanks the two of you that. oh it was so great um this play really, you know, you talked about sort of uh, tremendous sensitivity paid during the rehearsal process to the intimacy. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about it. Again, not everyone who's listening to this conversation will have seen the play, but uh, Gabby is asked to be, you know, in intimate, uh, explicit scenes and on stage, it's always really wild to be so close to people, um, <laughs> to be in the room with people who are being intimate with each other. It's just different than watching it on screen or on, you know, your TV set at home. So I wonder, you know, post-COVID, we have entered a world when we went back to work with, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion missions for the places, you know, that we go to work in. There are intimacy coaches. There's a different kind of HR, hopefully, theoretically involved, it, 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 uh, available to, to company members. Um, but this would be a play that would be extremely, um, you know, heartened I imagined as a cast member by all of those things um so can you talk a little bit about that in terms of being the only woman in the play um woman of color intimacy I mean a lot a lot is on you yes and um exactly what you were kind of hinting at Alana roundabout and Danya really created a very very airtight kind of framework to approach the intimacy um and so I'll just talk through like how that works um because you know for those of for the listeners who haven't seen the play like there is just a lot of explicit physical intimacy um but between my character and the the other characters in the play and so first of all, Anne James is our intimacy choreographer and she is just a really, really deep, insightful and skillful person. Um, so how, what her work looked like was one, like offering literal choreography for the beats of the intimacy in the same way as like, you know, you might tell a story on stage through dance, or you might tell a story on stage through fight choreo. Intimacy works, can work in the same way. So um, not only does she like sort of direct us about how to best tell the story using intimacy, but she also provided terminology that was desexualizing so that when we're talking about these intimate moments, we can do so in a way that feels less awkward, that feels a little bit more removed so that we can move through the process with a little less discomfort. Um, she's also there to like, make sure that 
all of us performers that are personal as people, like our boundaries are upheld. So if there is our, if there are aspects that we're not comfortable with, or if there's certain uh, ways in which we don't want to be touched or we don't want to interact, those all can be taken in consideration with the, with the choreography. And also she provides us with um, like closure rituals. So ways to get out of character, ways to let go of the um, heightened like emotions that come from um, intimacy or violence or whatever. So she was just an indispensable resource. I also will say that like the pace at which we developed the intimacy in the show was super slow. Danya essentially didn't enforce or dictate a time at which we would um, start interacting physically in, ex in an explicit way. It was kind of incredible because we had been rehearsing the play, doing sort of placeholders for the intimate moments. And then we reached a point in the room where we're like, okay, actually we won't know what this play is until we actually do the thing. And at that point, all of us were like, excited to do it and ready to do it um, and had you know and this was like maybe two or three weeks into rehearsal so we had developed a sense of trust and a sense of um, camaraderie to be able to do that work and the right. last thing I'll say is like also in, within the casting because the the my fellow castmates are just like really really wonderful guys like mm -hmm. really stand up generous talented beautiful people so um, that made things a lot easier too. Of course, of course. Well, I just really, you know, I'm just in awe of of you and your ability to be a vessel for a story in such um, a different way each time. And also, like, just to take it on. Like, it's just um, thrilling. It's thrilling to be in the audience when you're in in the play um I know that you have a show tonight and I and and guys Gabby talks for a long time in the play so <laughs> I want you to I want you to have time to do whatever you need to do to get ready um so one more question before I let you go is there a little known fact about Gabby Beans that you can share uh before you go on with your day Oh yeah, I think the, the the little known fact about me is I love to roller skate. And it's something that when I'm doing a show, I feel I miss because I'm afraid to injure myself so I don't roller skate, but like in my free time I I absolutely love to jam skate. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Do you do it in Central Park or or any of the sort of outdoor community places that that happens? I wish I'm not a really great outdoor skater. I learned how to skate in a gymnasium in bed -Stuy. So the wheels that I use I, and the type of skating I like to do, I just feel more comfortable indoors. And there's a lot of like really funny, like cool underground places to do that. But, um, but yeah. I love it. I love <laughs> it. From Germany to bed -Stuy. What a journey, Gabby Beans. Thank you. Thank you for being on the podcast today. I'm so grateful to have had this time with you. Thank you so much. And thank you for helping us um, spread the word about Jonah. I think that this is a piece that uh, can be a catalyst for healing. And as much as you've, you know, alluded to the fact that it's a, uh, you know, it's a lot to take on in a role, I can't express how vast my gratitude is to one, be able to inhabit a role that is so nuanced and deep and beautiful and be able to say Rachel's words. And also like that I get to do something that allows me to play on the edge of my abilities. And lastly, that, you know, that you appreciated the work enough to ask me to have this conversation. It's deeply meaningful to me and I'm very, very grateful. Oh my God, it's my pleasure. And just listeners, just so you know, Danya Tamor is Julie Tamor's niece. And I don't know what is in the DNA of the Tamor family, but they really are like just the creativity and visionary uh, minds that that this this young Tamor is is really like taking on 
New York theater by storm with her own voice and vision. Um, and so that's wild too, to see Tamor in the program and go, wow, like this family really um, has a way of telling stories that is so unique. And, and Danya and is incredible, visionary. And Rachel Bonds is such a beautiful playwright. The play is Jonah. It's at the roundabout uh, Laura Pell's theater, um, do you know right now until when it, it is in production? Yes, we're so we're supposed to close March 10th, um, pending any changes. <laughs> but right. yeah. we'll run, you guys. Run, run, run. In the meantime, I just wish you the most beautiful day. Congrats on the roll. Have a gorgeous run with the play. Until next time, Gabby Beans. Thank you so much, Alana. Thank you. Oh my God, thank you.